Uh, oh. Okay. Should we start? Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the lecture. In this lecture, we will have three great uh, talks. And uh, our first presenter, Harvey, is uh, a fifth semester of a bachelor in computer science. Harvey is very interested in operating system and uh, system security. I think that's why he chose this paper to present. Okay, uh, Harvey, let's go ahead. Thank you, Lenny. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the Excel kernel paper, uh, which was published in 95. So let's begin. Uh, what we'll be going over today, some basic background knowledge so that we can understand the paper, an executive summary of the paper, and then afterwards we will go into the messy details of the exokernel and the library operating systems, and we will conclude as always with an analysis and a discussion. So let's begin with the background knowledge. Operating systems. We all probably have one, but what exactly are they? Well, a simple answer is that it's just a kernel and a user um, collection of processes. Uh, the user processes are processes that just run with limited privileges on the user space. And the intuition here is that we don't want to allow users to execute arbitrary code or uh, access arbitrary memory locations. The kernel uh, manages these privileges for the users and gives all the other abstractions that you're probably used to, such as virtual memory, scheduling, uh, inter-process communication, and much more. Uh, to enable this abstraction, CPUs nowadays support two types of modes, a user mode and a kernel mode. In this paper, uh, we discuss the Altrix 4.2 operating system, and we compare this against our Excel kernel. Uh, this is just a monolithic Unix-based operating system, uh, very, uh, very standard one. So let's talk a little bit about exceptions and how they're handled now that we have this kernel context. Well, sometimes, as we all know, an instruction can fail, uh, a division by zero, an unallowed memory access, and so on. Uh, what the operating system does in this case is that we switch to kernel mode and we use the cause of the exception to look up in the exception table. So, oh, the image is not showing. Yep, here we are. Uh, we look in this exception table here uh, based on our exception number. And then this exception table just contains pointers to exception handling code. Uh, let's say, for example, we encounter exception one, then we look in the first entry of this exception table, then follow the pointer to the code for the exception handler, and then we execute the handling code. And this is done in the kernel context. So now that we've seen these two main properties, we can imagine an average scenario in a system. A process starts, it executes a system call, which is just a request from the user to the kernel. As a small example, you can think open file accounts in Excel, then the kernel code services the system call. And then afterwards, the user can uh, continue executing. And during this ex execution, as we mentioned, we can fall into exceptions, which we promptly switch into the kernel mode to handle. And then afterwards, we can continue executing. And as you can see from this diagram, the user isn't very involved in uh, basically anything. Everything gets handled by the kernel uh, through these arrows to the kernel mode, which is just the switching in the kernel mode. Uh, so far, we've seen only one process, but what happens in our system if there's more than one process? Um, well, first, let's think about an abstraction of a client and a server. Uh, sometimes when a client has a function that it wants to execute but has not implemented, it can uh, execute this function through something that is called the remote procedure call. Uh, the client calls a, this unimplemented function with some arguments. Then afterwards, these arguments get packaged by the operating system, sent over the network, and then get executed on this server that has implemented the function. Afterwards, the server sends back the result, and the client can use the result immediately. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that uh, this process can be abstracted for diff two different processes on the same system. If process A wants a function that is implemented by process B, it can 
uh, perform a remote procedure call. So just as a small visualization, this client performs the remote procedure call, then the arguments are packed for sending, they're sent over the network to the server, which receives the arguments, then executes the local procedure call, the function call, gets a result from it, and then sends it back to the client, which just uses the result. So you might be asking, what's the issue? Well, these abstractions that we've seen, the exception handling, the virtual memory, these are all fixed. The kernel handles everything with zero input from the program, which means that the abstractions cannot be extended, they cannot be specialized or, or replaced based on the needs of the application. And as you might imagine, there is no single way to abstract these resources efficiently for every single program. The information is hidden from the application, the information in the ex execution, so they can't help with resource management, which means that traditional operating systems are slow. And this is what the paper is trying to solve. So for an executive summary, traditional operating systems, as just mentioned, implement inter-process communication, virtual memory, and many other OS abstractions. But the problem is that these abstractions are too general and they cannot exploit the workload of the program for optimization. The solution that the paper proposes is to give each process access to machine resources and uh, access to abstractions through these library operating systems, which is the combination of the exokernel IGIS and the library operating system XOS. A main challenge that you might be thinking of is how do we do this efficiently and more importantly, safely? Uh, it's a little difficult to just give access directly to the machine to a process that's untrusted. And we will see this in a bit, but before let's cover IGIS. IGIS is an exokernel, as mentioned. It exports the processor, the memory, the translation look aside buffer, exceptions and interrupts and it uses a packet filter system with dynamic code generation. The XOS, the library operating system, is untrusted, and it basically uh, just implements basic operating, systems, uh, operating system abstractions from the application space, which is uh, very surprising, but true. Uh, it also implements inter-process communication and also virtual memory and many more, uh, which you can see for yourself in the paper. So let's talk a bit about these uh, two concepts that we just introduced. So what is the idea here? We want, to do, uh, we want to allocate resources securely, but how do we do that? Well, the first design goal that the IGIS exokernel has in mind is securely exposing hardware. We want to expose privileged instructions, DNA capabilities, CP the CPU, the translation look aside buffer, and et cetera. Uh, we want to expose allocation because we want programs to know what other programs own. And this can lead to better decisions in uh, choosing, for example, a physical page that can lead to lower cache conflicts. Additionally, we also want to expose names so that applications can request available data and they can know what they are requesting. And an example of what can be named is pages, uh, physical pages, pages that are part of the free list, uh, the discard position, cache TLB entries, and I'm sure you can imagine many more. The second design goal of IGIS is that we want to expose revocation. Uh, the main idea here is that we want applications to know when resources become available again so that they can request them. And the third design goal is a rigid policy. Uh, the exokernel wants to hand over the management of resources to a library operating system, but it still has the final decision and say in all granting and revocation of resources in the system. And this achieves uh, a separation of management and protection, which as we will see, makes the kernel very fast. So let's talk a bit about design goal number one. How do we securely expose hardware, allocation, and names? Well, IGIS allows programs to bind to physical resources through, their, through a concept called secure bindings. Uh, IGIS uh, present, gives a capability to a program when the resource is requested for the first time, thus authorizing it. And then whenever the resource is requested again, IGIS requests this capability that was given out so that it can protect the resource efficiently. And usually the 
XOS libra uh, library operating system does these requests for the processes so that we can maintain uh, the abstractions that were discussed earlier. So assume we have this process A that owns uh, TLB entry five. So it asks for TLB entry five and also presents the capability. Then the IGUS kernel will see that the owner of this capability uh, is A and it will return TLB entry five. Similarly, if a process C is requesting uh, page three for the first time, then IGUS can record this uh, secure binding and then give uh, process C the physical page and the capability so that it can access it efficiently. And you might notice that one of these physical pages has multiple owners, and this is enabled uh, through these well-known capabilities. So we have seen how uh, processes can bind to physical resources pretty safely, and this idea can be also extended to the network through the idea of packet filters. So packet filters are uh, simple bits of code that are provided by the applications through the uh, library operating system and then are downloaded into the IGUS kernel. Uh, on a received packet, IGUS checks the owner of the packet and then executes code to handle the packet without switching to the application, which as you can imagine is very fast because the application does not need to be scheduled for, it, for the packet to be processed. The code uh, for these packet filters is also generated at runtime. Uh, usually whenever packet filters are implemented in kernels, uh, the code is interpreted, which is much slower than this uh, runtime generation. Uh, and there's also a concept of application safe handlers, which can reply to incoming messages. Uh, the protocol name here is dynamic packet filter, otherwise known as DPF. And for a small example, imagine we have a packet uh, for process A from YouTube, uh, I guess will uh, check the owner of the packet, will equate it to A, then it will use the packet filter to handle the packet however process A wants, and then optionally it will also use this uh, application safe handler to reply to YouTube. So we have this reply packet as well. And as you can imagine, uh, this is really fast. So the paper uh, experimented with three filters, MPF, which is a common filter engine, uh, Pathfinder, which is the fastest one in literature, uh, at least in 95, and DPF, which is our filter. And the times here are in microseconds, and you can see that our code is over 10 times quicker and is very efficient due to this dynamic code generation idea where we generate the code at runtime. And also there was a test for um, basically the kernel without, an, without being provided an ASH from the XOS and also being provided an application safe handler. And as you can see, uh, as the number of processes grows, uh, the round trip latency also grows uh, when we don't have an uh, application safe handler, whereas it doesn't grow for, uh, for the case where we have an application safe handler. And this is because the application safe handler can separate scheduling from replying. An application doesn't have to be scheduled to reply because of the uh, application safe handler. And uh, yeah, basically this speeds up everything. So let's move on to design goal number two. We want to expose revocation. Uh, I guess usually revokes visibly. So applications are aware of the resources that are being revoked of them and it revokes invisibly in the cases that the revocation is frequent and the resource is stateless. Otherwise, we would have quite a bit of overhead notifying programs every time this resource is revocated. Uh, on a revocation request, the XOS releases the resource and also updates its state to reflect that the resource is no longer available. So if the IGUS kernel uh, requests physical page five, then the XOS uh, updates this physical uh, this page table for A, and then says that, okay, physical page five is no longer valid. It's been reclaimed, and it informs the kernel that it has uh, successfully updated its state, and that physical page five is no longer needed. But imagine if uh, the IGUS kernel requests this physical page five, and the XOS just says, no, I will keep it. Uh, we assume that XOS is untrusted, so a scenario like this is quite likely. Well, this brings us to our third design goal, the policy, 
the rigid policy of IGIS, uh, which basically states that we need a way to revoke forcefully. And this is done through the abort protocol. Uh, every single secure binding of the XOS is broken and the XOS receives a repossession exception, which allows it to fix mappings using that resource. So now if the same scenario happens, this is in the previous slide, I guess sends a repossession exception and uh, XOS either has to update its state or basically risk having, um, risk having the data in page five overwritten. So, so far, we have seen that we can achieve our three design goals with what we have seen of IGIS, these secure bindings, our network filter, and uh, these ASHs. But Ultrix, uh, the mature Unix OS, still has exceptions, context switching, and much more. And IGIS does need more to be a viable operating system. Uh, this here is a subset of the IGIS system call interface. Uh, so far, we have seen this alloc and dealloc um, of the resources. And fortunately for us, uh, IGIS does provide what was mentioned above. It provides protected control flow transfer, exceptions, address translations, and much more. And now we will see this S call and A call um, system calls. So protected control, tra uh, control flow transfers. Uh, First, you can imagine that the applications can request time slices in the processor so that they can execute. Well, after processes can execute, uh, they can also choose to switch to another application and donate their time slice. So the time that they have left to execute is donated to another application. And this is the basic idea behind a, protect, a protect, protected control flow transfer. Uh, these protected control flow transfers can be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, synchronous donates the remaining time slice that we have and all future time slices that A might have requested, uh, which can then be returned with a synchronous con uh, call back to the caller. And asynchronous only donates the current time slice. So as a small visualization, if we have this process A that runs for a while, then performs an S call to B, uh, we will switch to this process B, which then keeps its time slice and also all of A's future time slices until it S calls back to A, at which point it returns the time slice and execution continues as normal. In the asynchronous case, process A executes for a time, then it calls the B, B executes its time slice, and then afterwards execution continues as normal. So this protected control flow transfer was also tested uh, it was tested again this, against this L3, uh, which is the fastest implementation literature for control flow switching. And the times are once again in microseconds. And we can see that there's, a, there's an over three times speed up even on the slowest machine. Okay, so now we'll talk a bit about exceptions in IGIS. Uh, the way they're handled is quite different from uh, old tricks. Uh, three scratch registers are given to the application, which are stored in a predetermined uh, uh, memory region. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant uh, the predetermined memory region is given to the application in which it can store three scratch registers. The exception um, program counter and the exception cause are loaded. And then afterwards, we can use this exception, uh, this cause of exception to jump to an application specified a program counter that will handle the error. And you might notice that here we have no switch in the kernel and the kernel is not even involved in the exception handling. So we do not have to do the costly switch to the kernel mode. And this is staggeringly fast. Uh, these are some times taken to dispatch an exception in Ultrix and IGIS. And if you look at the overflow column, it's over 70 times faster than Ultrix on overflow and it also provides some more exceptions that um, Ultrix does not have. Uh, this coproc exception, which is the, an exception caused when uh, trying to use a disabled coprocessor. Ultrix does not allow uh, for the user to 
disable the coprocessor, but IGIS does, which falls in line with its idea of giving the application access to every part of the machine. So a small summary on IGIS. Uh, IGIS can be very efficient. Keeping track of ownership is very simple, as seen by the uh, secure bindings table. The kernel provides very little functionality outside of multiplexing these physical resources. And then this dynamic packet filter allows secure bindings to the network to be implemented very efficiently and be much faster than uh, even the fastest uh, result in literature. So uh, now we'll talk a bit about the XOS. So I guess an XOS, why do we need XOS? Uh, from what we've seen so far, uh, processes can communicate to IGIS directly, but the average programmer might, may find it very difficult to code without abstractions like virtual memory. So if we have a programmer trying to talk to IGIS, they might be very confused on how to actually use it. And the idea uh, of XOS is that we let the library operating system talk to IGIS, and the library operating system provides the normal abstractions for the user. So now uh, the programmer talks directly to the library operating system, which then talks to IGIS, and then reassures the user that it will handle uh, the dirty details. So XOS, once again, is a library operating system. It's untrusted. It implements basic OS abstractions from the application space, uh, such as inter-process communication, virtual memory, and many more. So uh, the paper runs multiple experiments on uh, multiple IPC abstractions. Uh, one of these is the lightweight remote procedure call, which we saw earlier. Uh, we uh, do a procedure call into a process which increments a shared counter and then returns its value. Uh, the XOS uh, implements this on top of the protected control flow mechanism that IGIS provides. And Ultrix does not actually provide this operation uh, natively, so many workarounds had to be found. So if we see here, these are the times uh, taken for some uh, common IPC abstractions such as pipe uh, and uh, the low, uh, the lightweight remote procedure call. And we can see that uh, there is an NA for Ultrix due to the fact that it does not provide this operation natively. And uh, Ultrix had to simulate uh, the lightweight remote procedure call. Uh, there were two implementations, one with pipes and one with signals. The faster one with pipes was still 26 to 37 times slower than the XOS. And the cost of adding new abstractions to Ultrix is high, as this example demonstrates. So virtual memory now. Uh, the paper had a hypothesis, uh, which was that the kernel crossings uh, the switches to kernel mode could be avoided by implementing abstractions at the application level, which would lead to massive speed up. And uh, this was tested with multiple memory operations. We'll mainly cover this prot one, uh, which is the time to change the protection of a single page from read to read write or read to execute. Um, and as you can see, prot one is uh, significantly faster on XOS. But if you look to the right, um, you will see that Ultrix still beats uh, the XOS at protecting and unprotecting contiguous pages. So this prot 100 is just changing the protection for 100 pages. Uh, and this is due to a weakness that we will discuss a bit later. So one main weakness of Ultrix was that we cannot add new abstractions. But can we do this for the XOS? And the answer is yes. Uh, and this is shown through this uh, trusted uh, remote procedure call. So in the remote procedure call, uh, we usually don't trust the server to respect uh, callee saved conventions. So we store callee saved registers and then restore them after uh, the result has returned. In this extensible RPC case, we trust the server to restore the callee saved registers. And this is called the trusted lightweight remote procedure call. And if you look to the right on every single machine, uh, this is much faster. And this just proves that extensions are feasible and they also lead to significant speed up. So to move on to our conclusion, the simplicity and limited number of IGIS operations allows for very efficient implementations as our experimentation has shown. The low level secure multiplexing of hardware is very efficient and is done through these secure bindings. 
The traditional operating system abstractions can be implemented efficiently at application level, as shown by the XOS. And applications can modify libraries to create special purpose implementations of uh, abstractions that we might want, as shown by the trusted lightweight remote procedure call. So before we get into the analysis, are there any questions? No, okay. So let's talk a bit about the strengths of the paper first. Uh, the paper is very well written and uh, I quite liked it. Uh, the secure bindings, the revocation and the abort protocol are all explained in great detail and complement the design goals of IGIS very well. Uh, the experiments ran on the primitives and abstractions in the paper are thorough and well discussed. Even the other primitive, uh, even the other experiments that we did not discuss here, such as uh, the dirty for the virtual memory, for example, are all uh, discussed. Uh, IGIS and XOS are much more efficient than Ultrix on most operations, with the only exception being the uh, the prot n and unprot n that we saw. And it is also much more feasible to efficiently implement new abstractions in Ultrix. Uh, in I guess I mean sorry than it is in Ultrix. Uh, however, uh, these new abstractions uh, come at a cost, which is the higher burden placed on the application. If the application wants a specialized abstraction like the trusted remote procedure call, uh, it has to do them itself. Some memory operations are implemented naively, which uh, the paper also admits and is the reason for the slowdown in the prot and unprot uh, 100. Uh, the concepts here are discussed only on a high level. There are no concrete implementation details. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine a case in which uh, you've seen that the high level idea is fairly straightforward, but when you've gotten down to implement it yourself, new uh, complexities have arisen. And I would have liked to see at least a bit of those uh, implementation problems um, discussed in more detail. And there's also a lack of uh, concrete implementations of capabilities. Uh, capabilities in the secure bindings context are mentioned uh, only on a high level. They're not, uh, the reader has no idea what they are. Are they a string? Are they uh, integers given to, the XOS through IGIS, uh, what exactly are well-known capabilities? Uh, these are some of the questions I was left with uh, after reading the secure bindings uh, part. So now that we've discussed the weaknesses and strengths of the paper, uh, we'll go into the discussion part. So, uh, my first discussion question would be to ask you if uh, exokernels will become more popular or if monolithic kernels will still continue to uh, dominate. And as a small reminder, uh, Windows and Ultrix are examples of monolithic kernels, uh, which basically means that the kernel manages abstractions and resources with zero user input. So are there any... Uh, basically favoring opinions on either side. I'm not sure, but maybe in some specialized systems with some specialized users, but I um, have no examples, but yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I also agree. <laughs> uh, using an exokernel is, uh, is, would be especially challenging, especially for a user uh, used to these monolithic kernels. There would be a bit of a shift uh, into getting used to such a kernel and the library operating system. Um, context, any other thoughts? Seeing as there are no more thoughts, uh, I'll give a bit of my opinion. Uh, the monolithic kernels are still really fast, as you might have noticed with your own computers. 
uh, even if they are slower than IGIS. And uh, this is a symptom of the uh, general mindset of the field, which is if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, some people in the room might have uh, might have heard of the BGP protocol, for example, which is notoriously um, not great, but uh, is still in wide use. And um, yeah, it seems a bit unlikely for IGIS or any other Excel kernel to break into the field. However, uh, I agree with a point mentioned earlier that it's potentially very effective in the hands of experts that know exactly what they want from their programs and uh, can lead to significant speed ups in uh, such specialized scenarios. Uh, a small reminder on the extensibility part in uh, remote procedure calls, we don't trust the server to respect callee safe conventions. So we devised this uh, trusted lightweight remote procedure call in XOS. And we also saw that these extensions are very feasible and lead to very significant speed up. So with that small reminder, uh, my question for you is what extensions could applications add to the uh, XOS library operating system? Okay, seems that there are no ideas in the room. So I'll discuss a few that were mentioned in the paper and one that uh, I thought could be potentially useful. So uh, for schedulers, we didn't cover them in much detail here due to lack of time, but there are these stride schedulers that could be extended. Uh, I believe you remember the concept of time slices that can be requested from the CPU. Uh, each process can define a sub-process and then allocate certain parts of its time slice to it. And as an example, if I'm process A, I can say the sub-process one gets half of my time, sub-process two gets a quarter, and sub-process three gets the last quarter. And implementing this abstraction in Ultrix involves a lot of uh, threading and is very prone to software bugs. So this is another point for the XOS library operating system. Another example in virtual memory is these inverted page tables for sparse address spaces. And um, an idea I had for IO operations, um, if, for example, we have a uh, memory circular buffer that we know will only receive data from a network uh, and uh, not write to this circular buffer, maybe we could allocate the entire, uh, maybe we could allocate more space for it. Uh, knowing that uh, this uh, process will not be sending anything out to the network, but uh, just a small idea. And this can uh, be extended to basically any abstraction implemented by the kernel. So anything you can think of probably has a special case in which these uh, abstractions could be extended. Okay. Um, so a small reminder on secure bindings. If this process A here can, uh, owns TLB entry five and presents a capability, uh, I guess will return it. And if process C requests uh, a page, then it will, uh, I guess will give the page to process C and then return a capability as well so that it can access it in the future. So the small reminder, uh, my last question for you is what would happen if a malicious application would gain access to an honest application's capability? And what do you think the Excel kernel should do in this uh, scenario? Um, so the way I understood it, you always have to owner uh, to the secure binding. So, uh, different application couldn't actually uh, access the capability of a different process without the permission from the process. Um, okay, that might have been a slight um, misrepresentation of what is happening by me. Uh, in all honesty, it was a little difficult to visualize how exactly these capabilities work. So I will say that um, when IGIS is presented with a correct capability, 
it will accept uh, the capability and return the resource regardless of who the owner is. So uh, apologies for that. Maybe my illustration was a little unclear in that case. So now that I've clarified that, are there any uh, ideas or uh, general thoughts on how this might be handled by the kernel in an efficient way? Okay, uh, seeing as there are no thoughts, I will share a solution that I thought of, which is admittedly not great. Uh, the problem here is, as I just mentioned, that IGIS uh, protects without knowing what it is protecting. So if presented with the correct capability, it will always return um, the physical resource with no questions asked, basically. And a potential solution to this could be that if a resource such as a physical page is very critical to the uh, application. Uh, I guess can record the owner um, in maybe a separate table or in this capability. Uh, in this capability pairing, it can create a pair of the owner and the capability. Uh, but the issue with this is that it goes against the policy of separation of management and protection. We want to leave the management to the library OS and uh, the protection to the uh, to the kernel, I guess. So uh, as I said, this is an uh, incredible solution. So I ask if maybe there are any other ideas, uh, any improvements to what I just said. Yeah, just a thought like, I thought if an attacker want to access a resource, uh, it could also fake the uh, and give it itself as the owner of this resource. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if you thought about this. Uh. Yeah, that could be a possibility. But um, I was mostly assuming that uh, actually a, a mistake on my part. I should have probably stated the assumptions before posing such a question. But I was assuming that uh, the Attacker cannot mimic another owner. Uh, so basically the Dolev Yao model of an attacker, but without, I, after it has stolen a key basically. <laughs> so uh, I was assuming that uh, a, another uh, owner cannot be mimicked, the, the name at least. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions or ideas, uh, I would just very quickly like to state my sources for this, which is um, the computer systems course. Uh, if um, any of these, any, if any of the beginning part of the background knowledge seemed interesting to you, I would implore you to uh, give this course a shot. It's very interesting. Uh, and with that being said. Thank you to my mentors, Lenny and Joel, and uh, thank you for your attention. Your camera is frozen, actually. Can you hear me, Joel? Yes, I can hear you. Well, she can't hear you, though. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, your camera is frozen, but yeah. I guess you're fixing that.
Is it work? Oh yeah, perfect. Cool. Uh, uh, this one's working. It's green. All right, we can get started. Well, I have the pleasure today of announce this beautiful student right here, Anuj, uh, who is a student of computer science at ETH, and uh, he's very interested in deep learning and medical problems in general. Uh, very motivated students, as I've had the pleasure to see. Um, and uh, so this includes transformer-based um, language and vision models that could potentially disrupt the healthcare sector. Um, and so he's chosen a paper on transformers today. So we'll give it up for Anuj. Woo! <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Savia. Um, all right. So I'm going to present on full-stack optimization of transformer inference, a survey. This is a paper written by authors mainly from Berkeley and NVIDIA. Um, let's dive into the paper. It's quite long, and there's a lot of interesting ideas here. So first of all, here's an outline of my talk. I'll first provide an executive summary. Then there will be some analysis and background of transformers, so you get familiar with the actual architecture. And then we go into the ideas that these authors have for optimizing the inference of transformers. They have four main ways of optimizing, which I'll come back to. And then finally, we move on to a perspective where hopefully we'll get a good in-class discussion. So an executive summary of the paper goes as follows. There's a context around transformers they're becoming increasingly more popular, and state-of-the-art transformer models, they require substantial compute resources. And uh, there is, they're becoming increasingly more popular. You know, we have ChatGPT and other models are coming along as well. So there's a need to deploy these models uh, on servers, but also on edge devices, which actually have very low compute hardware. So there's some interesting stuff going on here. Um, and the authors say, well, there's a challenge or there's a problem here where there's a gap in the knowledge of understanding of workload characteristics in, and the bottlenecks of transformer architectures. So the goal of the paper is to analyze the computational requirements of transformers specifically during inference and then survey and propose a full stack optimization strategy for deploying transformers more effectively. Full stack here means end to end. So they don't just look at a particular part of the whole transformer inference pipeline. They don't just look at hardware. They look at the complete pipeline, including the model itself. And then they get four main insights, which is that there's four possible avenues for optimization. One is to simply build a transformer hardware accelerator. Another is to use quantization and pruning on an already trained transformer then you can make optimal hardware mapping instructions for the operations involved in the whole transformer inference. And then finally, you could re redesign the whole transformer architecture through neural architecture search. So these are the four main insights. And what do they find? Well, if you combine some of these approaches, use the full stack co-design approach as they call it, you could achieve up to an 88.7 speed up in the transformer inference. This speed up is measured as something called EDP reduction. So EDP reduction is delay times energy. So you're looking both at runtime, but also the energy costs involved. And the reason for motivate, the reason they say this is necessary is because there are ways to achieve reduced latency, but at the cost of using much more energy. And they say, well, you know, that's not very environmentally friendly, so let's look at the EDP metric. All right, so now I'm gonna go and provide a little bit of background 
on the transformer architecture. Uh, you may be familiar with this uh, image, which is from the very original transformer paper, which introduced this architecture. Um, I'm not gonna go all the way deep into the architecture, but there are a couple of things you need to understand. So first of all, a whole transformer consists of multiple transformer blocks. And this is a transformer block. Within this transformer block, there are two, there are two modules. There's the multi-head attention module, which is this part, the green box. And then there's the feed forward network in the orange box. They're stacked on top of each other. The multi-head attention to provide some, uh, some intuition here, its purpose is to focus on different parts of an input sentence. Uh, so, you know, you have a whole sentence, there are multiple words in the sentence, and a neural network needs to understand which of the words are important and in which relation to each other. And the multi-head attention module helps do that. And then there's a feed forward network, which simply just processes this output further uh, by doing some operations on it, prepares it for the next block, which is often another transformer block, and so it continues. Okay. What is interesting or important to know about these blocks for the purpose of inference optimization is that there are different operations involved. And if we first look at the multi-head attention, you don't need to understand the full diagram, but you need to look at the X's first. So all the circles with an X, they are matrix multiplications and they're linear operations. And there's six of them. Four of them are the weight activation matrix multiplications. So those are the, the ones with a W. Weight activation matrix multiplications use the weight parameters of the model. But then there's also two activation to activation matrix multiplications. And the activation to activation ones, they only use intermediary matrices that are a result of the already performed multiplications. So you're not using any parameters for these. And then the oval parts, are nonlinear and other operations. We're mainly interested in the nonlinear operations. So we see that there's a softmax and there's a layer norm. Now, moving on to the feed forward network, we also have some operations. Again, look at the X's and the W's. So those are the weight matrix multiplications. There's two of those. And then finally, we also have some nonlinear operations, mainly a JELU and a layer norm. I don't know if you've heard of JELU before. It's kind of like a ReLU, but it's a Gaussian error linear unit. So it's actually a, kind of like a ReLU, but it's curved a little bit. All right. Now, there are some subtypes of transformer architectures. And if we look at the very, very original transformer, which was uh, you know, published in the Attention is All You Need paper, it looked like this. It was an encoder decoder style model, and it was used for machine translation. So at that time, they didn't really know all the ways you could use a transformer, but they used this for machine translation, you know, going from German to English or uh, some other language. And it involved both matrix multiplications, but also matrix vector multiplications. Now, later on, it was discovered that, you know, we can just use some of these transformer blocks and apply it to slightly different purposes. For instance, you could have an encoder-only model, which is very good for natural language understanding. And uh, a prototypical example of this is the BERT model by Google. And this one only does matrix-matrix multiplications as, as like the main operation. And then finally, we have decoder styles. Those are the ones that are really popular these days. They're used for natural language generation. For instance, GPT-2, I say GPT-2 here because that's the one they investigate in the paper, but obviously ChatGPT is like the hot stuff right now. And this one does matrix ve vector multiplication. One thing to understand about the decoder model is that you have an autoregressive uh, method where the output token needs to be input again. So you can kind of think that this makes for some uh, other types of requirements in terms of compute, since you have to keep reiterating on the next token. While on the encoder one, you provide it with the full matrix, perform the operation, and get the output. OK, so now that we have an understanding of the transformer architecture, let's actually look at the computations involved. Uh, so we do an analysis of bottlenecks and profiling of the computations. 
And we do this on an Intel CPU. That's what they do in the paper. And we do it for three models, BERT of two sizes, 110 million parameters and a three times larger BERT large. And then we do it for a single decoder style GPT-2. Notice that GPT-2 here has basically the same number of parameters as BERT base, so they are comparable in size. And the first insight one gets when looking at the floating point operations and increasing the sequence length, so sequence length is the input, the sentence, this is the number of tokens you provide to the model. So as you increase the number of tokens, we see that we get more and more flops. And in fact, this is a quadratic relation. And if we go back to the operations, it's very easy to see that at some point, there's a matrix multiplication that scales quadratically with sequence length. So this makes a lot of sense. Notice also that the blue and light green are models of similar size. So the number of flops in the BERT and GPT style are similar for similar styled models. And if you increase the size of the model, you get more flops. So that's the BERT large. But there's also another thing we need to investigate, and that is the amount of memory operations involved. So we call that MOPs. Uh, a single MOP is a retrieval of a byte from memory. So now we look at, OK, if we increase sequence length, how many MOPs are involved? And we see again that they also scale quadratically with sequence length. But you'll quickly see that there's one other interesting thing here. And that is that GPT-2 uses way more memory operations than a corresponding BERG architecture. And it's because it needs to reload weights for multiple iterations because it has this autoregressive style. So it requires many, many more MOPs. If we look at the trade-off between flops and MOPs, or basically the ratio between those, that is called arithmetic intensity. And that is a metric that's used to figure out if something needs a lot of computation or if something needs a lot of memory operations. So we're dividing the two curves from before. And what we notice now is that for bird style models, the encoder style models, we, increase, we initially have an increasing arithmetic intensity because as we get larger and larger matrices, we can do more and more computations per parameter loader from memory. But at some point, the arithmetic intensity starts to decrease. And that's because now the activation to activation matrix multiplication and softmax operations starts to dominate. So there's this, uh, and obviously it depends on the hardware, but for an Intel CPU, you know, at 512, you get the maximum number of uh, arithmetic intensity. Okay. Now let's look at overall, uh, overall latency for these models. Um, latency, again, scales quadratically, which is not surprising, as everything seems to scale quadratically with sequence length. Um, and if we just focus now on the bird style models, so that's the blue and the dark green one, we see if we break down latency, what is actually dominating the latency? Well, as we increase the sequence length, is the activation to activation matrix multiplications, the blue part that seems to dominate. So that's what's causing the latency as we increase sequence length. And then for encoder style, sorry, decoder style models, GPT-2, that's the light green one, we see we have way more latency due to the autoregressive nature of the model. Um, and it has a significantly longer latency uh, due to its reduced arithmetic intensity. And if we look at what's causing the latency, we see a slightly different uh, uh, relation where at all points is actually the matrix multiplications, which are the vector matrix multiplications that dominate the latency. So now that we have sort of a breakdown of what's going on in terms of latency and bottlenecks, uh, the authors say, okay, we're ready to start optimizing this. And their first idea for optimization is simply building a transformer accelerator. Um, so accelerator is a specialized piece of hardware that is designed to efficiently run deep learning. Uh, and you may be familiar with it in the form of the TPUs that, that Google Cloud Services host. 
and they can be designed to handle unique computational and memory requirements. A prototypical accelerator will look something like this, very simplified. The gray piece is the actual accelerator chip. And what the accelerator chip has, it has a network of connected processing elements that perform multiply and accumulate operations, that is matrix multiplications. And then there's some local registers to store the data here for optimal reuse. Then there's a scratch pad on chip memory that can hold a subset of weights and inputs that feeds to the processing array. So you kind of have this loop where you can quickly get the activations and, and weights that you need, but then you can't hold all of the network on the local scratch pad memory. So you need to also have an off chip DRAM, which holds the full network architecture weights and activations. Um, so at Berkeley, they have, they've, they've made a piece, a piece of software called uh, Gemini. And Gemini is uh, an interesting thing because it's actually a deep neural network accelerator generator. I had not heard that word before, but what it does is you give it some input requirements of what you need to perform with a model and it proposes an architecture for an accelerator. And they had previously already built a hardware chip based on this uh, Gemini generator, which was meant for CNNs. And it looks like this. We can see the same elements as before. The processing elements is now a systolic array specifically. There is an on-chip circuit for nonlinear operations in CNNs, that is ReLU and MaxPool. And then finally, we have an off-chip CPU that can do other nonlinear operations. And obviously we again have the DRAM. So it's kind of like the same architecture as before, but it's meant specifically for CNNs. And then they take the transformer architecture and say, hey, let's, let's run inference on the CNN chip and see how it does. And then uh, they got this insight that 96% of the time on this chip was spent on non-matrix multiplication operations, despite the fact that the total number of floating point operations in a single transformer inf inference pipeline is actually MAC operations, multiply accumulate operations. So this seems strange. The other thing they found out was that nonlinear operations, softmax, JLU, and layer norm were all offloaded to the CPU because the chip could simply not do them. It could only do ReLU and max pool. And then finally, the Gemini is configured such that it does all the matrix multiplications in integer of eight bits. And this means that all the weights and activations must be dequantized and quantized because the nonlinear operations which are conducted on the CPU has to be performed in floating point units because that's what it used. That's, that's how the CPU is configured. So if we look at the time spent on different operations during a BERT, single BERT inference, only 1% was spent on matrix multiplication, despite the fact that 96, uh, sorry, 99% of floating point operations for inference are actually matrix multiplications. And instead, it was wasting a whole lot of time on doing this dequantization, and then also spending a lot of time on the nonlinear operations. Taking these insights, they said, we can probably do better. So they wanted to optimize the accelerator specifically for transformer. And what they did was they found out or they figured out that a redistribution of the on-chip memory could probably yield better performance. So they reduced the scratch pad to 64 kilobyte, that's a reduction by four, and increased the accumulator by four. Their argumentation here was, hey, we're not really changing the full memory size here, we're just redistributing so they seem that would be a fair comparison. Um, this should optimize the reuse of outputs during matrix multiplication. Then because it was doing so many quantizations and quantizations and requantizations, they said, you know what? Let's switch the model out to an integer only version. Let's just do iBERT, you know, the whole transformer in integer version. And then finally, we need to perform these nonlinear operations that are not possible on, on the accelerator. 
because they're transformer specific. So let's create some circuitry that can actually do the JLU layer norm and softmax. Having implemented all of that, they were able to achieve a whopping almost 40 times speed up in performance, which is quite a lot. Okay, I've already alluded to the whole quantization bit. So let's look a little bit more into that. That's another way they propose to optimize the inference. So quantization reduces the precision of the model weights and activations in neural networks. And it's very simple. You take high bit floating points and you convert them to lower bit. That could either be lower bit floats or it could be lower bit integers. So it just looks like this. And what's nice about this is that you get significant improvement in the number of operations you can perform and you also get better energy efficiency. Um, so how do you actually do it? Well, you first train a model with floating point precision, and then um, afterwards you quantize the weights and activations. So you have a pre-trained model that's pre-trained with floating point. You make all the weights integers or eight bits, and then you do a little bit of fine tuning or calibration on some additional data, and then you end up with your uh, quantized model, which now has much, much lower bits in their weights. The approach is very simple because it doesn't really require retraining the whole model from scratch. But the downside is that, as you might have guessed, you know, going from 32-bit float to 8-bit integers, you probably get a drop in accuracy. Um, they did some experiments. So they said, hey, uh, how, much, how many operations can you do if you have 32-bit, 16? And as you can see, as you lower the bit size, you're quantizing, you can perform many more operations on a standard GPU. But apart from being able to have reduced latency because you can do many more operations, you actually also get more energy efficiency. So if you just look at the addition for 8-bit and 16-bit, you can see that if you half the bit size, you get halving of the energy. Now this relation doesn't always hold, but it's just interesting for addition, it actually does. So. Um, I've already talked about what, this, what these figures are showing. Another way they said they could optimize the models is through the sparsity concept. So if you have a fully trained deep neural network and you investigate it, you will find that a lot of the weights are actually just zeros. So this shows a fully connected network and the white circles are showing zeros. And zeros have no meaningful uh, um, activations. So we could potentially just skip all the uh, matrix multiplications that involve zeros. So you could prune the model um, with, uh, you could prune all the weights that are effectively zero after the model has been trained. Um, and this can reduce the computational and memory requirements because you just skip the operations involving zero. And this can reduce latency and reduce energy consumption. So seems like a nice idea. Um, there's two ways to do it. There's unstructured pruning where you say, you know, we train the model and we allow any weight to be zero and we're fine with that and we, we leverage that sparsity. So for instance, we have a sparse matrix uh, of weights here and we say, hey, let's just remove all the zeros and we get this compressed matrix that we can then use for matrix multiplications. Uh, obviously, the problem here is that it's not given how you would achieve this compressed matrix and how you would make the multiplications in standard hardware. So unstructured pruning, although sounds very nice, is actually quite hard to do. Another way to do it is to do unstructured prune, sorry, structured pruning, which was uh, which is done very much in CNNs. So here you take entire filters or layers and just remove them from the, from the model if those filters and layers are almost zeros. So for instance, you can have a trained uh, CNN here and the white filters are showing filters which are useless and you could simply just remove those and that would optimize inference. Um, the authors unfortunately didn't actually do any experiments with the uh, sparsity concept but it was part of their whole serving of approaching for optimizing the transformer. Then the third insight they had was you could change mapping instructions. So mapping is uh, 
by definition, the assignment of computations to physical hardware resources. Um, and this includes where to execute operations, manage the data movement, how to utilize memory and compute units. And you can have multiple valid mappings for the same operation. So valid here just means that the end result is guaranteed to be correct. And two different valid mappings on hardware can have very different performances in terms of latency and energy costs, but still lead to the exact same result. And the total space of possible decisions for this is very, very large and it's called the map space. So you can't just simply traverse the full map space. So what the authors did was the, um, oh, before I get to the experiment, I'm just gonna provide as an actual example, matrix multiplications, usually done as a three nested loop. So it's also called the naive way to do a matrix multiplications. That's usually how you would do it in a, you know, exam where you traverse the rows, traverse the columns, and then you multiply. And that's actually three loops that you're conducting. But there is room for some variability here because nobody says that you have to perform the loop in said order. So you could swap out the order of the loop. You could do loop permutation. Another thing you could do is you could switch up the tiling factors. So that means you don't have to execute a loop to finish before you start another loop. So you can end the loop prematurely and come back to it later. Those are tiling uh, factors. And then finally, where do we want to perform the operation on hardware and when? That's the spatial and temporal mapping. So you know you could do operations in parallel or you could do them in sequence. All of those can result in a valid mapping, but some of them may be way more efficient than others. So they wanted to find performant mappings and, and they used a BERT and CNN for comparison or investigation. And then they used a tool called a time loop mapper to search for 100,000 valid mappings. So this tool randomly executes the mapping on hardware and tries to see, okay, how, how well does it do? And for each of the valid mappings, they uh, analyzed or, or computed the latency times energy, the energy delay product that I mentioned before. And then they plotted that. And here's the result. Uh, on the left, you have BERT, and on the right, you have the CNN architecture, ResNet. And what's interesting here is that for, for the left here, which is the least EDP, and up to the one that uses the most EDP, there's an up to 10,000 factor of difference for the same valid mapping. So their claim here is that you know investigating the mapping space can yield really good results because you might be decreasing your EDP by a 10,000 factor, you know, in the, in the best case. Then finally, fourth insight was, you know, you could just change the whole transformer architecture with a neural architecture search. Uh, and the idea here is that there are probably multiple different variations of an architecture that yields the same accuracy and the same inference. And quickly to outline how a neural architecture search is conducted, you have to have a valid search method. You could, it could be reinforcement learning based where it tries to optimize its search by finding rewards. So you have to define a reward. Then in the search space, you confine it because otherwise it's infinitely large and you confine it by saying, you know, we only want to look at certain operations that could be, for instance, convolutions, relus, and pooling operations. Then you sample from those, stack them in layers, and then you quickly retrain an inference to evaluate them to see, are they any good? And if you find good uh, uh, architectures, you, know, you, you, you take them, you, you do the uh, computations for accuracy and hardware metrics, and then you take them over to the search space again and, and iteratively, iteratively try to find better and better architectures by improving on the ones you already found. Um, so they conducted a NAS for finding transformer inference. Doing a NAS is computationally really, really heavy. So they actually took like a downsized model of BERT to do this. They didn't take the full BERT model, but here's what's interesting. 
they found a transformer architecture with lower latency and similar performance. So the cross here is the normal model, like the original one. And then the blue ones are ones they found do, through their NAS. And what you want is you want uh, as low latency as possible. Perplexity is an error function. So we want that as low as possible. And you can see they found one which had lower, ED, uh, lower latency, but almost similar performance. And they also measured the EDP. And then they said, OK, like our model, original model is here. But through their NAS, we can actually find ones which have lower EDP and actually have better performance. So this seems to be quite useful. That's the four insights. So I'm coming to the strengths and weaknesses of the paper now. Do you have any questions around um, what I presented in terms of the insights? All right, so the strengths and weaknesses of the paper, according to me, is that strength, well, they did a pretty rigorous analysis of the flops and mops for different transformers, and they achieved a remarkable 39.6 reduction in latency with their hardware accelerator, which was optimized for transformer. And they also managed to propose multiple optimization strategies across the full stack, which included both hardware, model optimization, mapping, and changes to the architecture. So it's a very complete paper. The weaknesses are that profiling is only done on a CPU, but normally you might not just use a CPU for transformer inference. Maybe you're using a GPU or a TPU. So it could be interesting to look at the profiling done on other hardware. Then there's very little focus on potential trade-offs they do speak a little bit to the performance degradation, but not a whole lot. And they also don't really speak to the cost and feasibility of making the hardware accelerator and how it ties into already existing pipelines of transformers. Then there's no investigation of current state of the art models like GPT-3, Llama, or Palm. And then the analysis is only done for inference of transformers, but they do state that in the title of the paper. So that's, I guess, more of a limitation. It's not a, a real weakness, but it would be really interesting to know how to optimize training as well. Moving on to discussion. Why do you think the authors focus so much on BERT when obviously decoder style models such as chat GPT, GPT-4 is the really hot stuff these days? And this paper is recently released, and they're still focusing on BERT, which is kind of old news. Why might that be? Yeah? Uh, as far as I'm aware, like ChatGPT and GPT-4 aren't open source yet, so uh, doing some benchmarking on them is probably very difficult. That's a really, really good point, yes. GPT-3 although not completely open sourced, the architecture is somewhat revealed in their, in their paper that they published, um, but you would have to build it from scratch knowing the architecture, but that's a really good point. Other, other ideas as to why they're going so much for the decoder, uh, encoder style models? So you know that's the distinction here because BERT is encoder and GPT style models are decoders. And if you think back to what operations were involved, there was an in interesting difference. I don't know if any of you guys remember. So the encoder style models were doing a lot of matrix matrix multiplications and you passed in the full matrix of tokens at once. But for decoder style models, you're performing matrix vector multiplications and it's autoregressive. So for each token, you have to recompute again and again. And you know, their accelerator is a systolic array and systolic arrays are really good for matrix multiplications of large matrices. But once it gets to matrix vector multiplications, there's not really a lot of yield. So to, I guess, make their paper look good and interesting, they really only investigate encoder style models because systolic arrays are optimized for encoder style models, matrix multiplications, not for the decoder style. 
Um, and alluding to what you said before, um, it's kind of like a, another spin on the question, but you're absolutely right. Like decoder models were obviously not their focus because they have a systolic array, but another possibility is, and I just have like a screenshot from Hugging Face because I tried to see, can I get a GPT-3 architecture out of the box? And I couldn't, but you can get BERT, uh, BERT base, BERT large and GPT-2 directly off of Hugging Face, which means experiments are really, really easy. Um, one very interesting insight I would make to this is, you know, you probably require a very different piece of hardware for doing decoder inference. And there was this whole thing with Sam Altman recently getting ousted out of OpenAI. And I don't know if you had the side story, but he was actually trying to build a chip for chat GPT inference, because that's something that's quite unique and not something that's readily available in already existing hardware accelerators. So Having the thought that this is the future, you know, you really do need some special architecture here. Okay. Um, the authors did experiments on an accelerator which was made for CNNs, and they called this their baseline. And then they said, you know what? We optimized the hardware accelerator for transformer, and we achieved an exciting 39.6 speed up. What do you think about this comparison and result? Is it a fair comparison? It's kind of weird, right? You have something that's built specifically for CNNs, and then you run experiments on it. Then you run experiments on something that's meant for transformers, and you say, do you see the difference we made? You know, you can make anything look really good if you just choose the right competitor. So, you know, if you go out in the club, stand next to somebody where you look more attractive. That's a key insight. Um, it would probably make more sense to compare a baseline for off-the-shelf GPU or TPU, because that's where models are usually, uh, transformers are usually run, and not on a CNN-specific accelerator. It's kind of a strange comparison. OK, finally. When comparing baseline architecture, baseline accelerator versus the transformer one, they switch the BERT model into an integer only version. So, you know, you have BERT, you just make it into an integer only model. And then you say, you know, doing that, we improve inference with 39.6 over baseline. What do you think about that comparison? It's kind of weird because if you want to make valid comparisons, you should have the same model. You can't just go from floating points to integers and say that's a valid comparison because obviously you're going to get much faster compute with integers. So it's kind of strange that they don't do a, a fair comparison here. Okay. Um, final thing, I'm just going to sort of lay out the, the insight here is that they, they uh, propose pruning, but <clears throat> it might not be so straightforward to implement. And that's because if you do pruning of a model, you can have faster inference, but you've locked the model in and you will have a really hard time retraining the model. So in practice, pruning is a little bit difficult. It's useful if you've locked in your model and you know that's the only model you're going to work on and do inference on. But if you, if you want to repurpose this and retrain it, pruning might not be so useful. Um, finally, I really want to thank my mentors, Savia and Atterberg, who have been really, really helpful. And uh, thank you.
Um, Nisa? Yes. Hello? Yes, uh, we are trying to upload, I mean, download his slides in PPTX. So okay. yeah, I will I let will... you know. Okay, sure. Your voice is actually so low. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Uh, Nisa, you can introduce your student. Okay. So the last talk will be given by Igor. Uh, he is in his fifth semester in computer science. Uh, in his free time, he enjoys doing sports and uh, going to the gym. Uh, he will uh, talk about this paper uh, called System, Systems Architecture on Quantum Random Access Memory. And yeah, okay, you can go ahead, Igor. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation on the recent paper, Systems Architecture on Quantum Random Access Memory. How do I go to the next slide? Do I have to use the laptop? Okay. All right. Quantum computers for the first time were proposed in the 1980s by the physicist Richard Feynman and Soviet mathematician Yuri Menon. The goal was to use quantum mechanics to simulate problems, particularly in the natural sciences, like physics and biology, and classical computers were unable to simulate many of those problems. First quantum algorithms, like the Deutsch algorithm, started appearing in 1985, and the first experimental demonstration of a algorithm, quantum algorithm working on a quantum computer was made in 1998. It was made using a two-qubit quantum computer. Since then, Many more quantum computers have been developed, this time hosting tens and hundreds of qubits. This is an image of Google's Sycamore computer, which is hosting 70 qubits. Quantum computers have many promising applications, including areas like cryptography, quantum searching, data processing for machine learning, molecular simulation, and many more. But unfortunately, this potential cannot yet be realized due to several limitations like the limitation in system size, referring to the number of qubits that can be hosted by quantum computers, as well as limitations in fidelity, referring to the difficulty of keeping qubits in a coherent state for prolonged periods of time, as well, of high, as, well as high quantum gate error rates. One particular issue I want to talk about to you today is the I.O. bottleneck. The I.O. bottleneck refers to the difficulty of encoding classical data into quantum states and performing quantum computation on that data. This process, with today's state of art, takes up so much time and resources that it potentially renders quantum algorithms completely useless. The solution proposed by the paper is a design of a quantum random access memory that efficiently queries data from classical memory and encodes this into quantum states. But before I get into the design of the architecture, I first want to go over some fundamentals of quantum computation. Let's start with the qubit. The qubit is the fundamental computational unit of quantum computers. While a classical bit can be, can be in state 0 and 1, a qubit can be in state 0, 1, or both simultaneously. This is referred to as a superposition, and it can be noted in the so-called Dirac notation. Psi, in this case, is the wave function, and 0 and 1 are the two basis states. The superposition is always a linear combination of those two basis states. We can also see that both basis states are noted as vectors. That means that Psi itself is also a two-dimensional vector containing the coefficients alpha and beta. Once we measure a qubit, 
it collapses into either one of those basis states. And we can also tell some information about the probability, which is stored inside the coefficients. If we square, if we take the amplitude of the coefficient and square it, we get the probability that the qubit collapses into either one of those quantum states, uh, basis states. As long as the qubit is not collapsed, information can be stored inside the variables alpha and beta. Just like with classical bits, we can combine qubits to store more information. To do this, we leverage a quantum mechanical property known as quantum entanglement. Here we can see an example of a two qubit system where we have the basis states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. The coefficients alpha tell us about the probability that the system collapses into either one of those states upon measurement. So how can we operate on qubits? In order to operate on qubits, we use quantum gates, and we can link those quantum gates together in order to form quantum circuits, which are essentially quantum programs. Quantum gates can be written as matrices, and to perform a quantum gate on a system of qubits, we simply multiply the, gate, uh, the matrix of the gate by the state psi of the qubit system. Let's look at a simple example. Here we have the X gate. The X gate always operates on a singular qubit, and what it does, it simply flips the coefficients of the, of the side qubit. Of course, there are many more quantum gates. Not all of them operate on a single qubit. Some of them can operate on two or even more qubits. One I want to talk about in particular, which is the CX gate. It's also called the controlled NOT gate, which uh, takes a control qubit as input and also another second bit with which it, which it operates on. And it flips the variables uh, alpha and beta of the second qubit, depending on the state of the first qubit. If it's one, they are flipped. If it's zero, then nothing happens to the second qubit. Let's recap on QRAM. QRAM enables us to read classical data into quantum state, which is essential for quantum computation, especially if we want to compute on some classical data. But let's look at RAM first. RAM takes an address i as input and returns the data in the memory cell xi, which corresponds to the address that was taken as the input. QRAM, on the other hand, instead of taking a specific address as input, takes a superposition of all possible addresses as input. For a memory of size n, we use logarithm of n quantum qubits inside the superposition. Here is the most math mathematical notation of such a query. And uh, on the right side, we can see an example where the input is a superposition of basis state 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 0 with the data bus, which is at first empty. It's set to basis state 0. After the QM does its thing, uh, we get a new output, which is again a superposition, but this time combined with the corresponding memory cell data. There are two distinct approaches in designing QM architecture. The first one is the gate-based QM architectures. And these architectures are characterized by the fact that they use logic gates to encode and manipulate data qubits directly. These types of architecture are usually the simplest designs possible, but they unfortunately have very bad query latency as well as they use very high numbers of gates, which scale in O of n, where n is the size of the memory. Second approach are the router-based QM architectures. They always use some form of quantum routing, which basically just means routing quantum data from one location to a different location. Uh, and this reduces the query latency quite significantly to O of log n, but unfortunately requires very high numbers of qubits, which is O of n. So what is a quantum router? A quantum router takes an input bit qubit b, and it routes it either to the left or to the right, depending on the router qubit a. If a is in basis state 1, the data gets routed to the left. If it's in basis state 1, the data gets routed to the right. Of course, if R alpha is in a superposition, data can be routed into both directions simultaneously. This is implemented using so-called controlled swap gates, as we can see in the diagram on the left. I want to talk about one particular architecture before going to the actual proposed architecture, which name is uh, Bucket Brigade. The routers are arranged in a binary tree, and the query is implemented using two stages. The first one being address loading, and the second one being data retrieval. In the address loading stage, 
We set the router bits by routing address qubits into the tree, starting with the most significant qubit. The ith address qubit always determines the state of the ith layer routers inside the tree. Here we can see a small animation how this happens. We start with the most significant qubit. It, de it, de it determines the state of the first layer router of the binary tree. Then we route the second one, which goes to the left because the first one is in state zero. And then we route the final qubit, which goes first to the left and then to the, route, or to the right and determines the state of the final router. After we've determined the states of the routers, we can now route a data, qubit, uh, data bus into the same tree. The bus, is, the bus qubit is routed into the tree and eventually reaches the target memory cell, after which data can be written into the target memory cell and routed back out of the tree to return the superposition. So now let's start talking about the proposed QM architecture. The proposed QM architecture gives, gives solutions to several problems. First of them being increasing memory capacity. The issue is, is that the number of gates and qubits necessary to implement such a QRAM increases exponentially with the number of address qubits in the memory system. So the architectures I talked about earlier, which are the gate-based and the router-based architectures, simply do not scale well with such an increase in memory size. The solution to this problem is to develop an architecture which does not uh, does not input the, the, whole, uh, the whole memory memory space, but instead focuses on small blocks. Such an architecture is called uh, okay. Shit, that doesn't work. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, such an architecture uh, provides a virtual address space that exceeds the capacity of the physical quantum random access memory. Okay, the second issue is the overhead of routing qubits. Performing qubits on a physically distant um, Performing gates on physically distant qubits is, uh, is very difficult, and we first need to bring the qubits closer to each other. This is, very, this is a serious problem because uh, the tree structure doesn't allow us to store them in a 2D space easily uh, because in a 2D space, the distance between the qubits increases exponentially if we try to uh, map it onto such a space. <laughs> um, Okay, the third issue is the fault tolerance, which refers to the errors that can happen in QRAM. Uh, errors in QRAM can se seriously impact the utility of said QRAM and often can eliminate <clears throat> the quantum advantage of the algorithms completely. And the solution to this issue is uh, to provide small correction codes, uh, which can scale up the QRAM uh, with very low overhead. Okay, overview of the architecture. The goal is to implement quantum query access to a memory of capacity of size n, which is referring to the virtual memory size, while only using a physical memory of size m, where the virtual memory size is always bigger than the physical memory size. We do this by storing memory in the disk and breaking it down into segments. And we only load one segment in the, at the time into the QM. For the following uh, illustration, we assume that the memory is split into k segments which means that the size of the virtual space is k times the size of the physical memory space. Here we can see an image, an illustration of the proposed architecture with k equals one. That means that there is only one qubit that's responsible for determining which memory segment we read into the QRAM. And then there is two other qubits, A1 and A2, which specify the memory address inside the, inside the memory segment. Since we are talking about a router-based architecture, it is again divided into two stages. First being address loading. A layer of M data qubits are fixed at the output of the routers. These are later used for data retrieval. And the address bits are then routed into the QM following the conventional bucket brigade procedure. Data qubits are prepared. When address I is queried, the data noted the address I is flipped to 0 and 1. Here we can see the final state after these steps have been completed. We can see that we are querying address 0, 1. And as we can see, uh, the data qubit in the last layer is set to 1 exactly where the memory cell is located that we are trying to query. The second stage is data retrieval. On the top left, we can still see, see the, the state after the previous stage has been completed. First, we write classical data into the qubits at state 1. After that, 
we copy the data to the root using CX gates and then copy data to the bus qubit. We uncompute the data retrieval and swap in the next memory segment and repeat these steps until we've iterated over every possible superposition such that the QRAM can output uh, the result. In the end, we uncompute the data retrieval. There are three optimizations that are proposed by the paper, which are address qubit recycling, lazy data swapping, and address pipelining. We'll start with the first optimization being address qubit recycling. We can see that during the data retrieval stage, specifically between B and E, the router bits are not used. Uh, we simply do not need the, the, the data bits in, internal to the tree since the router bits can be used instead. That means that by removing those data bits, which I'll mark in the following animation, we need uh, less qubits in the resulting architecture. The next optimization is named lazy data swapping. Classical data is loaded and unloaded se <clears throat> sequentially for each segment of the virtual memory and unloading and reloading data is necessary if the memory pages that we are looking at sequentially are the same. So instead of unloading and reloading data multiple times, we can simply compare the memory segments using a C0 gate. If the result of the C0 gate operation is equal, uh, is equal to one, then we do not need to, then the pages are different and we do need to unload and reload the data. If there's zero, then uh, the pages are the same and we can simply continue. Uh, lazy data swapping provides swap gate savings of O2 to the power of uh, N minus 1. The third and final optimization is address pipelining. The naive approach of address loading is that Q address qubits are routed into the tree sequentially. The I plus one, the L plus 1 qubit waits to be routed to the Lth qubit until the Lth qubit has reached the destination at level L, which leads to running time of O of M squared. However, with address pipelining, we do not need to wait for the previous qubit to reach its layer in the binary tree, and we can start routing the next qubit as soon as the previous qubit has gone one layer further down. This improves the address loading runtime from OM squared to OM, where M refers to the uh, number of address qubits. All right, let's talk about mapping and routing. Qubits and hardware can only interact with its nearest neighbor. Let us assume we want to perform a C0 gate on two qubits. That means that first, to perform the C0 gate, we need to move those qubits physically close to each other in hardware. Here is one algorithm that, uh, that reaches such a goal. We can see the orange qubits uh, on the top and on the bottom. They are far away from each other, but there are several qubits in between. We can use swap gates uh, sequentially to route the data from the top A qubit next to the bottom B qubit, after which these qubits can interact. After that, we can simply do the same procedure to uh, route the data back to the, to the qubit while keeping it in an entangled state. This strategy is what we are currently doing with quantum quantum computers. Um, however, uh, the latency is pretty bad. It's uh, O of D, which refers to the distance between the qubits measured in the number of uh, qubits between uh, those two. Uh, this is even worse than it seems at the first glance, uh, since as the tree size increases, which we are storing in the memory, the distance of those two router qubits actually increases exponentially. That means that by performing those uh, swap circuits over and over, we completely lose our whatever we want on the query latency with the router-based uh, quantum random access memory architecture. On the right, we can see on the bottom, we can see a different approach, which is called the teleportation circuit. As this circuit, on the other hand, performs the same job in constant time. But there is one requirement, namely that the qubits separating the two qubits we are trying to communicate uh, have to uh, have to not store any significant data in their states as these qubits are measured at the end of the circle and the data would get lost. So it's important that if, if we implement this teleportation circuit, that we find a mapping of qubits on the hardware that, uh, that the qubits in between don't store any significant data. It means we need to find an embedding 
that maps the binary tree into hardware where all routing qubits do not carry any information. The paper proposes a method to do that, and it's called the H tree recursion. Here is a simple example of the H tree recursion. We can see we have the binary tree, which is the architecture of the QM, and we map this binary tree onto a two dimensional space. This also scales well for larger binary trees. We can see that this process is recursive in the image B. And here is also an example with uh, a larger binary tree, which has capacity 16. Next, I want to talk to you about noise resilience. QM is hi highly susceptible to noise, and especially with current uh, compu uh, quantum computer hardware, uh, a lot of uh, errors happen. Prior work has revealed that intrinsic noise resilience in bucket brigade QM uh, is also observed in proposed virtual QM. But the noise resilience I'm talking about only applies to Z gates. Here we can see the commutator relationship for C0 and Z gates, which are part of the implementation of our QM. The consequence of this relationship is that if an error happens in one of those nodes, then the error doesn't spread up the tree, but only affects the subtree of the said node. It doesn't, noise resilience doesn't mean that errors doesn't happen. Noise resilience means that the errors don't spread very much in the architecture. In order to quantify noise resilience, we, uh, we define uh, the term query fidelity for a single query. Here we can see two states, psi out and psi out with an apostrophe. Psi out is the actual output of our quantum random access memory, while psi out with an apostrophe is the ideal output of the quantum random access memory. Uh, this notation basically means that we take a scalar product of those two, and if those two differ, the fidelity uh, becomes zero. If they are the same, then the fidelity goes towards one. Due to the property of C0 and Z gates, the following uh, inequalities can be made, uh, which describe the fidelity for Z gates and the fidelity for X gates. Uh, since the resistance property only relies to Z gates, we can see that there is an extra two to the power of M factor for the X gate. It means that the fidelity is uh, smaller for the X gate. Epsilon refers to the error rate of the corresponding gate. Let's go over the evaluation and results. First, we'll start with the evaluation methodology. The performance of the new QRAM, uh, QRAM is theoretically analyzed and simulated, and comparisons are made to other state-of-the-art architectures like Bucket Brigade QRAM and Select Swap QRAM. Classical simula simulation technique called uh, Feynman path simulation is applied to efficiently compute the results of the QRAM queries. Here we can see the first diagram. We, look that the we see that the scaling with respect to qubit count and the Clifford depth is the same for all proposed architectures. Uh, and that SQC plus BB, which is a combination of two architectures, suffers from uh, def uh, deficiencies in exponential overhead in T depth and uh, T counting complexity. We can also observe that the results of the SQC plus SS architecture are very similar to, the Q, uh, to our QM architecture. However, it's, imp it's important to note that the SQC plus SS architecture is, uh, uh, is a gate-based architecture, which means that it uh, takes a lot of query time to perform one read operation. Our conclusion is that the proposed QM outperforms or at least matches any resource counting compared to the state-of-art QM architectures. Here we can see another diagram, which compares the teleportation-based routing with the swap-based routing. Exponential extra swap depth overhead leads to loss of logarithmic scaling and query depth. It means that swap-based communication scales exponentially worse than teleportation-based communication. In fact, if we use swap-based communication, the whole idea of the bucket brigade QM and the lower query latency time uh, gets completely overridden by the fact that the swap gates take up so much computational time. All right, so our conclusion. The proposed QM addresses challenges of scaling with memory capacity, query latency, fault tolerance, 
through a virtualizing QM using latency-free mapping to 2D grid architecture using H3 recursion and leveraging intrinsic-based noise resilience in the circuits. In the analysis for the strength of the paper, I wrote that the paper introduces a groundbreaking QM architecture, which is superior to the previously discussed architectures, which are current state of the art. And the comprehensive design of the architecture is provided together with a compilation framework, which is referring to the Feynman path simulation. On the weaknesses side, I wrote that the design is very complex and the author himself admits that it cannot yet be implemented on current quantum random access memory. The author says that if the speeds of, the, uh, of today's QPUs increase times 10 and the uh, error gates and the error rates uh, decrease by a factor of 10, then this uh, design can be implemented on today's quantum computers. Also, the design requires a lot of resources, in particular referring to the number of qubits, uh, which makes it also impossible to implement on today's architectures. All right, I'll go over to the discussion. The first discussion question is, how can different scientific and technical fields collaborate to contribute to the development and implementation of quantum random access memory? All right, so I listed a few fields, one of them being the physicists, which can work on the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, Electrical engineers uh, can work on the hardware architecture as well as the design of the quantum computers, while computer scientists can work solely on the development of, and optimizations of the algorithms. And software engineers can also create interfaces to quantum random access memory such that it can also be used uh, from classical computers. So we can create an interface between both of those. What are the academic industry opportunities for, com for computing created by quantum computers? Okay, so some of them are in cryptography. As I said in the beginning, uh, quantum computers have the ability to break a lot of encryption algorithms that are used today, one of them being RSA. Uh, by efficiently factoring large numbers. That means that new algorithms need to be developed and implemented. Uh, also, there are applications in machine learning, which means that quantum machine, uh, quantum machine learning algorithms can be developed, uh, which can enhance pattern recognition and optimization uh, of analysis. My final question is, what are the computing problems that classical computers outperform quantum computers on? How can quantum architects optimize quantum uh, classical computers for those problems? Okay. So the first issue with quantum computers is they, that they have very high error rates. It's very difficult to keep, keep qubits in a coherent state. And because of that, if we need to perform computations with very exact results, uh, quantum computers are very ineffective for that purpose. Also, a lot of general purpose computing software has already been written for classical computers. So in that sense, uh, classical computers will be superior to quantum computers, at, at least for the time being. Uh, to further optimize uh, classical computers for these problems, uh, we just list uh, some general optimizations like uh, the advancement of CPU architectures, uh, advancements of uh, parallel processing capabilities, optimization with memory, like with cache and uh, random access memory. Do you have any questions? All right, thank you very much for listening. And also thank you very much to my mentors.
things before we uh, close this session. Um, we're gonna release uh, synthetic reports that you need to basically write that report after your presentation. It's just conclusion of your pres the paper that you presented uh, together with all the information that you got uh, in this course. So make sure that you um, fill up that synthesis report uh, in time and submit it. I will also, I will announce it on Moodle. And uh, similar to other uh, sessions, we have a feedback uh, on Moodle. Please feel free to provide feedback to the presenters. And uh, I think quiz is also available now and you can also attend it. So Merry Christmas, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Stable, I like, is that, no, 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 no,